Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Long Box Carpentry. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is J.D. DeMott. Hello. How you doing, J.D.? I'm doing good. We got some fun comics to talk about. We got some fun comics, and we also have to say that you and I have been up to absolutely nothing fun lately. No, we certainly did not go to Chicago and see Hamilton. No, absolutely not. We are here for the third and so far final episode in our trio of episodes looking at the Halloween tie-in comics, because there are still a surprising amount of them. Yes, and I was kind of surprised. Like, I didn't really realize that there would be this many when we initially talked about doing this, but I think we saved some of the best for last without right. spoiling too much of my thoughts. Tonight, just as in our last episode... All of our comics that we're going to be covering are written by Stephen Hutchinson, the guy who wrote and directed Halloween, 25 Years of Terror, the documentary series on the entire franchise, who in our last episode wrote a bunch of little indie one shots tying in Halloween. But here he found himself a home at Devil's Due Publishing. What's your history with Devil's Due Publishing? Devil's Due is one of those publishers I don't have a whole lot of personal experience with. I'm pretty sure I've not read anything by them until we sat down to do these comics. Mm. But I've heard a lot of good things about their G.I. Joe run on comics. I know that they published Hack Slash by Tim Seeley, who we'll be discussing later. Oh, yeah. That was probably somewhat responsible for them getting this license because mm. they showed that they could do horror. I know them, of course, for Hackslash, which ultimately moved over to Image, but I did read the first volume of it, and I can definitely see why that made an impression. And I'm trying to remember what else they did that I've read, because I still have yet, despite being a fan of 80s cartoons, have yet to really explore any of the G.I. Joe comics. Not even the original Marvel stuff. I haven't even gotten to The Devil's Due yet. Mm-hmm. Let's see, I'm trying to remember what else they had, because they were kind of like that mix of licensed titles and creator own stuff. I don't know anything too much more about them other than just Hackslash, G.I. Joe, and now these Halloween comics. Oh, that's right. And looking at their stuff, they also did Dungeons & Dragons. Oh, it was announced in 2015 that they planned to merge with First Comics. That's a blast from the past. They did Evil Ernie for a while. They did the Street Fighter. That's right, because they were tied with Udo and Entertainment, so they did all the Capcom stuff. Oh, they did it. the Army of Darkness mm. for a little while, at least. It looks like there's too many series, which I think I might have read one of the first issues of those. And I know, which we'll probably be getting into at the end of this episode, they are one of those publishers who became notorious for just kind of stop paying their creators after a while, mm. which, you know, that's what happened to CrossGen. That's what happened to a number of other big publishers, and they mismanaged their business, and they technically are still around, but I know they've had to let go of so many of their different properties over the years. Like again, G.I. Joe has moved over to IDW. It's like IDW kind of swooped in and gobbled up everything. <laughs> right. Because I remember there was a time when them and IDW were big competitors as to who could get which license. Yeah, them and Boom. Mm -hmm. Like if you had a licensed property, those were the ones that you kind of wanted to go to because then right. you would prioritize it as opposed to like something like Marvel or DC where they might put it out, but it's not going to get this nearly as much attention or focus because they have their own catalog they want to promote. Right. And even Boom is still around, but IDW has won that battle. Right. IDW has become what Dark Horse was in the 90s, basically. Pretty much. So yeah, all of these comics that we're covering here were published over the course of 2008, pretty much like month by month by month. They all kind of just followed a set schedule. And we have three comics that we're going to be covering here. We have the miniseries Halloween Night Dance, the one-shot Halloween 30 Years of Terror, and Halloween, The First Death of Laurie Strode. Sort of. Sort of. We'll get to it. The promised and proposed first death of Laurie Strode. <laughs> she doesn't die yet. yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let's just go ahead into Halloween Night Dance, which is a four-issue miniseries that they published from March to May. Again, written by Stephen Hutchinson. I don't really have much new to add about Stephen Hutchinson from the last time we talked about him. And the art for this miniseries was done by Tim Seeley, who, as we mentioned, was the creator, writer, and often artist, not the initiating artist, but often was the artist on Hack Slash, that popular comic series that poked fun at slasher properties. Yeah, 
I'm a bit of a fan of Tim Seeley's art and his writing as well, I suppose. He did a, a pretty cool Ant-Man and the Wasp miniseries over at Marvel. Hmm. I know he's worked on Grayson, which was the post-Nightwing Nick Grayson Robin series where he was a spy because he got outed as Nightwing. And so he became this James Bond type figure for a little while. I know he's most recently his own creator own project called Revival mm. over at Image that I read a crossover with the comic Chew. Yeah, he's a really good artist. His writing's generally pretty solid. He's a really good creator to bring into a project like this. Yeah, and I'm looking at him. He had runs on Wildcats, did a ton of G.I. Joe comics. He gets pretty regular work at the big two. He's one of those talents who's been all over the place, both writing and drawing, not always doing both. He's kind of like Phil Hester. Sometimes he'll just draw, sometimes he'll just write, sometimes he'll do both. Mm -hmm. A very prolific talent. He's got a ton of credits over the last few years. So it's really nice seeing a glimpse here. And I was looking it up. This was done after Hackslash. I couldn't remember if this was before or after. I was pretty sure because I saw something. I think they attributed Devil's Due getting the license to them showing off that they could do horror with Hackslash. Right. So let me jump into the synopsis of Night Dance. Our story is set in Russetville, Illinois, a neighboring town of Haddonfield on a Halloween set between H2O and Halloween Resurrection. Two years earlier, aspiring ballerina Lisa Thomas was out on a walk while babysitting a young boy named Daniel when he got away from her and disappeared into the abandoned farmhouse of Charlie Bowles, a famed serial killer from the 1950s. Entering a trapdoor leading to a cellar, she finds the boy unconscious at the bottom of the stairs, bleeding from the head, but before she can get help, the figure of Michael Myers slams the door shut. Lisa and Daniel were trapped down there for two days before search parties found them. Lisa's fingers covered in blood from trying to claw her way out. In the present, she's still struggling to get over her traumatic fear of the dark as she wants to stop feeling like a child and hopes to one day escape into adulthood. Her friends Sean and Nikki try their best to help, even talking her into skipping school to attend a local carnival, but she feels like she's holding them back by not wanting to go on scary rides, and she keeps seeing the figure of Michael Myers lurking in the shadows. And it's not helped by the letters from Daniel. Ever since the incident, he's kept mailing her drawings, but they've lately taken on a twisted edge, showing Lisa naked and covered in cuts, and include an old photo of a girl named Judith, a teenager resembling Lisa. Elsewhere, teenagers Abigail and Ben sneak into the Bulls' farmhouse for some shenanigans, only to find themselves attacked by Michael. Abigail comes to, finding herself tied up and bleeding from a slit wrist, but manages to work herself free, finding Michael sitting in the living room, the body of Ben hanging halfway into the lit fireplace. Abigail makes a break for it, with Michael giving chase. Marcy and Ryan Nichols, a married couple from Chicago, are driving into Russellville that night, bantering in their car as she gives him Halloween candies from a bag. They suddenly hit Abigail when she runs into the road, then veer off into a tree. Ryan is dazed from hitting his head on the wheel, so can't help as Marcy runs out to check on the girl. Michael suddenly appears, spearing Marcy on a knife before disappearing with her into the night. Ryan can't find her anywhere, so carries Abigail to the hospital and desperately tells his story to the sheriff. It's not so much that the lawman doesn't believe Michael Myers is in town, as he doesn't want to, and his delays in sending out search parties lead Ryan to break free from the hospital as he wanders around in a desperate search for any sign of his wife. Before meeting up again that evening with her friends, Nikki is killed by Michael. Sean is with Lisa, who heads up for a shower, only for Michael to toss a dead cat in with her and mess with her fear of the dark by turning the lights on and off. He calmly marches out of the house, right past Sean, who decides to pursue, leading to his death at Michael's hands when he finds Nikki's body in the graveyard. Lisa discovers her room has been plastered with the violent, childlike drawings actually drawn by Michael, and worries this means something may have happened to Daniel. Racing out of the house armed with knives, she runs into Ryan, and it turns out Daniel is the little brother of Ryan's wife, Marcy, and Danny's family is who they were heading into town to check on Big Twist. Arriving at the house and finding the door booby-trapped with razor blades, they find little Daniel and his parents sitting on the couch, all of their throats having been slit several days ago. Learning Lisa first encountered Michael at the Bulls farm, Ryan heads there with her reluctantly in tow, with the police also on their way after Abigail came to in the hospital and told them what happened. Ryan and Lisa arrive, finding a trail of his wife's Halloween candies laid outside. Inside, he finally finds Marcy, draped against a wall, her head hollowed out as a jack-o'-lantern with a lit candle inside, and the candies piled between her spread legs. Devastated with grief, Ryan can't even fight back as Michael smashes his fingers, cuts out his tongue, and slips a Michael Myers mask over his head as Ryan is sent out to die under a hail of police gunfire. Lisa tries to fight back, but her only avenue of escape is going back down into the dark of that storm cellar. Unfortunately, Michael is down there too, and Lisa is swallowed in darkness. She comes to later, but finds herself naked atop a box of broken glass, buried alive in a grave marked Judith Myers. So, J.D., do you recommend Halloween Night Dance? 
There are parts to it that I enjoy, but ultimately, no. It merges the shorter, creepy tale that we would get with the one-shots that we discussed previously, but it pads it out with too many characters, and there's too many coincidences that I don't really think work to really make it enjoyable. There's good stuff here, though. There are parts that are really unsettling in a good way. Ultimately, I just didn't find it as satisfying as some of the other stories that Hutchison has done before or since. I do recommend it. I think this is actually some of the strongest writing we've seen in the Halloween franchise as a whole. While the plot is very coincidental, and in fact, even just writing the synopsis here definitely laid a lot of that out, it was interesting how the way in his typical style he did it in a nonlinear fashion, where things are kind of all swirling in and out of each other, we're going back to the past, we're going to the present, people are having memories and dreams. His actual writing is still incredibly strong in terms of the captions where he really gets into the heads of these characters as they're going through what they're going through. And I love the art. It was one of the most harrowing comic book reads I've ever read in terms of building genuine horror and dread. That said, I think it goes too far at times. I think it's overly mean. I think it is a little overly twisted to a point where it kind of cheapens itself. But there's still a lot that I like. And I would put this up there with Halloween and Halloween H2O was one of the sharpest installments of the entire franchise. Hmm. Fair enough. Like I said, there was a lot of good things here I'll recognize. I personally found some of the transitions between the flashbacks and the modern day, I found a little disjointed and threw me off at times. But I do agree that some of the murders and acts here do go almost a little too far at parts. But like I said, it's right on the edge of like recommend, not recommend for me. It feels like all these books that I think some of them we really enjoyed were because they were just quick little Dr. Loomis's son is treating Lindsay Wallace. There was a brevity to it. Yeah, there's a brevity to it. And it gets in and gets out. I think this dwells too long on characters that some of them I enjoyed. I liked Lisa, the main character. I kind of liked Ryan and his search for his wife. But the rest of them, I felt like padding. They felt like the characters that are just included just to up the body count. I don't know if that's necessary in a Halloween story. I don't think the number of kills has ever been what Halloween should be about. That's what my issue was. It just made it seem more cruel and just gory just for gore's sake. I'm guessing we're talking about the characters of Nikki and Sean primarily. And then there's Abigail and Ben, which are kind of more your typical slasher movie victims. But I like Nikki and Sean because not only are they there so that Lisa has someone to talk to, but there's also someone to take away from her. Right. I do think, though, that Nikki, her death was so sudden and yet so lingered upon. Like, Mm -hmm. not only him coming up and strangling her at the door, but then her coming to as Michael starts basically making a display of her on the floor. What I liked is not often enough do you actually get into the head of a slasher film victim as they're being victimized. True. But it's so heavy. Yeah. (laughs) It gets so heavy at times that on the one hand, I credit it for making a genuinely sophisticated and powerful scene. But it's also so harrowing that on top of a lot of other stuff that happens, it becomes relentless. Mm -hmm. Then that whole story of Sean is hanging out with Lisa, but doesn't realize that Nikki has the hots for him. And he's finally been told, hey, you have this chance with this amazing girl. Why aren't you taking it? He tries to take it. And she's dead. Right. I kind of like that moment because it reminded me a lot of Laurie Strode and Ben Tramer and how innocent it was and also how tragic. Mm -hmm. But even the deaths, there's a sexualization to the deaths that Stephen Hutchinson has been doing that. He does linger a lot on the victimization of women in his comics, even more so than the men. Mm -hmm. And that there is a sexualization to the deaths that Michael has never really done before in terms of his displays, like the trail of candies leading up to Marcy's vagina, you know, basically, where they're all piled up. Then also, you know, his assault on Lisa while she's in the shower and we're seeing her completely bare naked as he's sitting there flipping the lights on and off, staring at her as she's suffering in the dark. And even the final scene where Lisa wakes up naked in a box of broken glass. Yeah, I don't want to say it's gratuitous, but it is right there on the borderline because on one hand, it's something you could actually believe happening in some of the Halloween films. It's cruel and it's coming from a cruel killer. Michael is a cruel person, right? but it's almost got just that extra little twist that makes it uncomfortable. Right. I mean, it's supposed to be uncomfortable, It's not true, but it's not, this is not a fun comic at all. No. No. It's not a fun slasher, which it doesn't have to be, but it still feels a little overly edgy. 
Yeah, and I think if you're going to spend four issues on this many characters and then pretty much everybody dies, it almost feels like, well, what's the point? I mean, I'm okay with it when it's a brief story, like one good scare or something like that. But I think when you're going to spend this much time with all these characters, you kind of want somebody, even if it's just like a Pyrrhic victory. Right. But to just have everybody die and Michael Myers is one step ahead of everybody, despite the fact that there's a lot of things that nobody could plan for. Like, was it Abigail who ran from the car? Yeah. There's no way that he could have planned for that necessarily. But the fact that he makes it seem like it was all part of his plan to attack this one girl whose only crime seems to be that she resembles Judith Myers. Well, I never got a sense of a plan. I thought he was putting it together as he went along. Maybe, but it just seems like if he is adjusting as he goes along, he's really, really good at it to a point that it seems impossible. I mean, and admittedly, that is part of the movie lore to a certain extent, but I think it's shown off a lot more here because there's all these characters that are connected to each other. And that farmhouse. And that farmhouse that just seems a little too, how could he know all this? Or if not played out this way, seems a little far-fetched. Okay, let's break it down. He encountered Lisa a couple years earlier. He was probably watching her and then seeing the whole notes that Daniel was still sending to Lisa. And so his plan was to kill Daniel and start using the notes to mess with Lisa in plans for that. I don't think he expected Daniel's family to come looking for what happened at the house, at least that quickly. And so I think Ryan and Marcy were just things that kind of stumbled in the way. Mm -hmm. But again, a lot of it does turn into happy accidents on his behalf. <laughs> Not so happy on their behalf. Right. If you really break down the plot, like I did putting that synopsis together because I tried to linearize everything as much as I could, it's a pretty typical slasher movie plot. There's nothing too complicated about it. Mm -hmm. But again, it's the way the story is told. I actually really liked the way it danced around how it was almost like a puzzle that gradually started putting itself together in front of you in terms of not quite knowing how everything fits together until it suddenly reveals. And the one ridiculous one was, Daniel was my wife's brother. But even then, that kind of worked for me because it was like, yeah, then that's the entire inciting incident, him and his family disappearing as to why that would bring these two people here in the first place. Mm -hmm. I liked the mechanics of how the plot was put together. It had a Nolan-esque quality to it, which you don't expect from a Halloween tie-in comic. Right. I think it did do some of those aspects well, though at the beginning, it really felt disjointed to me. Like I had trouble mm. keeping track of who was who, why they're all connected. And yeah, we kind of get answers to it. But like I said, I just didn't feel as satisfying because it just felt like either coincidence or Michael Myers is playing a really long, long con. Yeah. Well, and then also that this ties into the universe established in the last few issues, which it is part of that continuity where Michael Myers has literally just been continuing to kill dozens and dozens of of people over 20 years without anyone knowing he's still alive. Right. And only Loomis is putting the pieces together. And by this point, Loomis would be long dead. So it's like right. nobody's sitting there putting the pieces together anymore. That part I'm okay with to a certain extent, because my guess is that they're probably spread out enough. But he does such elaborate ways of killing people that you'd think someone would pick up on how many people are dying in incredibly elaborate ways and put on display. Especially right around the Halloween season. That seems to be a little weird. Even if they don't want to accept that it's Michael Myers, they would have chalked it up to a serial killer. Or a copycat or something. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, I love that he has a drawer full of masks. It makes sense. You know, that rubber is only good for so many years. You can't right. go 20, 30 years with the same mask. Especially when you're lit on fire several times, you keep getting things thrown in your face. Yeah, I mean, blood is not good for latex. And that would explain why his mask is slightly different in every film, too. <laughs> He just picks up a few new ones every now and then, you know, and sometimes they update the model. What company keeps making those masks? Silver Shamrock. Oh, well, there you go. That makes sense. I'm still surprised there has never been a tie-in comic mixing the continuities of the Michael Myers Halloween and Halloween 3 just for the hell of it, just for a one-off or a miniseries. I would totally read that book. Especially when you got the Cult of the Thorn. You could so easily make them the Cult of the Thorn. <laughs> But even like the character of Lisa is just a really great character study because with the old time jumps, you focus on the dark and these things that happened to her in the dark and only gradually do they realize what actually happened and then that Michael was tied to it. And then you have her dreams of going off and studying ballet tied to these images of her as a ballerina and these little ballerina figurines she has in her apartment. It's a very artistic touch that I really enjoy. Right. 
And speaking of artistic, I really got to say, like, Tim Seeley knocks it mm. out of the park in this comic. Like, we'll have to get to it later on when we get to another artist. But on this entire Lombok's carpentry, he's probably one of my favorites that we've discussed so far. I'll instantly agree with you on that. There's a tendency in a lot of horror comics that they want to go super either sketchy looking to make it look rough and like, you mm. know, edgy and moody and atmospheric. Or they go ultra detailed. Right. And this is just kind of cartoony, but not so much that it's right on that edge where it's recognizable what's happening in any mm-hmm. given scene, which sometimes in certain horror comics, they you can't really decipher what's on the page half the time. It's not so much this cartoony, but it's very clean. Right. Very clean, solid lines, light on the base or details. It does have that character design quality to it, like you'd see in animation just slightly more refined. Mm -hmm. And he's great at laying out sequences too. He's great at emotion. I mean, for all I said about Nikki and the way that she died, you know, when she gets the knife in her throat, just those three panels of the blood dripping out of her nose, matching the tear rolling down her eye. Right. The three successive panels as she dies. That's haunting. Right. And also just a quick shout out to the colorist too, because Mm. certain panels are like when Ryan finds Marcy as a human jack-o'-lantern, the orange glow with the dark bluish background, Mm -hmm. it's really striking. It's just one of those panels that I think will stick with me for a while. Right. And that's where the mixture of the pacing and ideas behind Hutchinson's script and Tim Seeley's art This is just so strikingly done, just so talented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the story is not the strongest, but the way in which it's told, I have never had anything in the Halloween series, even the original and H2O, that have had moments that were just as powerful of a punch as some of the scenes were in this. Yeah. Even though, like I said, I don't respond to it quite as much as you do. But some of those moments, like I said, like the close-up of Marcy's mouth, teeth all broken and... And the carved jack-o'-lantern smile, yeah. Right. It's just, oh my God, like that's terrifying and yet gruesomely awesome at the same time. And that that grin is right in the face of her husband who is breaking down to the point where all the stuff going on around him just doesn't matter anymore. I think at that point, he almost just wants to die. Like he gets slashed by Michael and he's just looking at him saying, please... And that, again, Michael kills him in as horrible and cruel of a way as he can. Break his fingers, cut out his mouth, put my mask on him, and make the cops think it's me as they gun him down. Right. I know they kind of toyed with that in the movies a little bit, where they have people wearing those masks. That's a straight up reference to the end of H2O and the beginning of Resurrection, where he kills the paramedic and makes it look like it's him. Yeah, I try to forget Resurrection as much as possible. He also did that in Halloween 6, where he switched outfits with Dr. Wynn. So, I mean, yeah. he's made other people the Patsy before. Okay. It's been a few months since I watched through all of them. When again, and this is a story taking place directly right after that ending of H2O and the opening of Resurrection 2. So that would have been a plan fresh in his mind. And I did also want to credit Elizabeth John is the name of the colorist on this series. And she's the one who did all that great work. Yeah, with Courtney Via, I believe, is mm, the... Okay, I think that must be on later issues. Yeah, it's at least the one I'm looking at, which is the fourth issue. It's got Elizabeth John with Courtney Via. Right. I also like Marcy. There are both pros and cons about the way in which we find her dead. But the way she dies is so sudden and so shocking. Right. That we just see this husband and wife just hitting the road for a trip. We don't even know why. They're just kind of bantering about candy in the car. This girl runs in front of the road. They hit her. They hit a tree. She goes out to check on her. And instantly, Michael is behind her with a knife through her chest. Mm -hmm. There was no chance to even do anything to react to even him being there. Right. And that's so shocking. From his point of view, seeing that over the broken steering wheel is Michael and the wife being held up on a knife just slowly sink back into shadow. One of the things I find so tragic for Ryan is the fact that he knows this is Michael Myers. Mm -hmm. He saw her get stabbed, but he's still holding out hope that he might be able to save her, despite the fact that he probably knows that Michael Myers is not known for taking prisoners. He just wants to know. Right. And it's that much more tragic when he finds her. And that's the moment probably I love the most, but it's also like just a punch in the gut when it happens. And I gotta say, I love this comic's use of Michael in shadows, because that's such an often shot that we see in the movies, especially the first one, of Michael slowly emerging from shadows, where first you just see the hint of white from the mask, and then the figure starts to fill out. Mm -hmm. This is one of the first times I've seen them replicate that in the comic. Yeah. 
I know there's a shot at the end where he's in the rafters of the barn and Mm -hmm. kind of doing a Batman thing, which normally I might mock, but I think it works because, you know, he jumps down and attacks Brian and it's effective because I think looking up and seeing somebody like, you know, that pale mask just staring down at you is genuinely creepy. See, and here I was hoping he would just lower himself down on one arm again like he did in (laughs) H2O. We should mention at the carnival, there's that whole scene of Michael in the fun house. We're not really in his thoughts, but it's just watching Michael as he looks into the fun house mirrors and just starts having his visions and delusions about seeing his sister have her period for the first time, mixed with suddenly him as a child looking himself in a mirror covered in blood. It's very interesting stuff getting into the head of Michael Myers. It's one of the few times he doesn't really describe it with captions, but we just kind of see it. Yeah. A lot of the narration comes from captions from the characters who are on the page, so they really don't do that for Michael, obviously. But the fact that what they can do with the art is a nice touch. Right. What do you think of them going with the idea that Michael has always been like this, even as a kid, as opposed to just one night he snapped? I have mixed feelings on it. Realistically, it makes more sense. And I think Stephen Hutchison was always going for a little bit more of a reality to it. Even though it's a heightened reality, it's definitely not as supernatural as the middle trilogy of films. So I kind of understand, like, you wouldn't just have a kid who just snaps and kills his sister when he was a perfectly normal kid before that. Right. But I kind of liked that fact that they never really explained that in the movies. Like, they hint at certain things, but they never really ever try to explain what made him snap. Oh, it was Sam Hain in the Cult of the Thorn, totally. Right, of course. I mean, <laughs> but... This takes place in the H2O revised universe, right, 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 right. but I kind of prefer it just being an unanswered question rather right. than implying that he was always kind of messed up, but I don't hate it either. It's just a different spin on things for me. Yeah. One of the things I found while looking at interviews is I know Rob Zombie's Halloween remake came out one year before all these comics. And I know Stephen Hutchinson wasn't the biggest fan of the way that Rob Zombie refocused and re-explored everything on Michael and telling his story. So I'm almost wondering if some of this is his kind of response to that. Never do we get a story where it's like just following Michael. It's always still glimpsing him through other people's eyes and through other people's memories. And this is like that one hallucination sequence. It's like one of the few times we kind of really see what Michael thinks. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that, no, he was just always a quiet kid that nobody expected this to happen from because nobody really knew about the violence that he was thinking about, that he would visualize the blood and visualize the violence and that he was having these thoughts and fantasies that he ultimately brought to life. I kind of like that they have that. I've always been more partial to when one night he snapped. But on the other hand, that doesn't really make sense. Right. So if you're going to do a let's go back and explore Michael's a child. Yeah, let's just have it be that he's a kid who just hasn't taken that extra step to act on his fantasies yet. He's got a head full of things that he hasn't really figured out how to act on. And that was the one night that he acted on it. And he's been acting on it ever since. Right. It does get into a lot of the sexualization of the violence again with Judith having her period while she's naked on a bed and Michael then seeing himself covered in blood in a mirror and It's striking imagery. I like the depth and sophistication of it. It's, again, maybe a little too far, but I don't know. It's kind of hard to argue if it's too far or not. Yeah. It also doesn't help that we're two men discussing this. A comic made by two men. Yeah, exactly. It's not really for me to say. I can see a lot of women might be completely turned off and perhaps rightfully so by it. I don't want to dismiss that at all. But even for me, like I said, it kind of pushes the boundaries and I think it does for you as well. But it's just the fact that I don't feel qualified to give a definitive answer on whether or not it is too far. Right. And part of that is you can have stories that do push boundaries and explore taboos and even sexualize violence and horror and all stuff. I mean, one of my favorite films of all time is Hellraiser, and that in no way sexualizes horror at all. No, no. <laughs> I think it's just it was so surprising to see it here in Halloween because Halloween has always been more just kind of your cheap slasher movie, even when it's well done. It still kind of followed just the mechanics of teenagers get killed by Michael and never really got deeper into it than that. Mm hmm. A large part of it is Michael is a very misogynistic killer, especially as he's presented in these comics. He has a misogyny of his own. Right. And is it wrong to explore his misogyny 
I don't think the comics themselves are overly mis- I think they are in a little, some small ways, but I don't think the comics are overly misogynistic so much as they're exploring his misogyny. Right. I think in terms of the comic's own misogyny, it's just slight ignorance about not realizing how far it's gone sometimes. Well, I know like that was one of the problems I had with Autopsis. Right. So I, I think Stephen Hutchinson has a slight tendency towards that. I'm not right. saying he is misogynist. I'm just saying that when he, he- He might not fully get the boundary lines. Right. I think it's become a lot more open in recent years as to like some of those problems. Mm-hmm. I think it's always been discussed, but it's, I don't think it's been as discussed as frequently in the last five to ten years. Well, and let's be fair, a lot of conversation came out of Rob Zombie's Halloween itself. You know, right? <laughs> it is something that if you're going to read these comics, you might want to be aware of that there are parts right. that are just upsetting and might not be for you. And I totally understand that. But I mean, like if you had Mercy finding her body if the candies were coming out of her mouth instead of out of her pussy. Right. I think that would have probably been better fitting of the moment. I think like the end scene, why does Lisa have to be naked in the box of broken glass? Well, I mean, and I think part of that is like, oh, it makes it hurt more. Like it's if you don't have clothes on, it's just there's more places to get cut. But you're also like fully showing full on full frontal nudity. Right. And even it's kind of shocking how it suddenly comes where it's like we get to issue. I can't remember if it's like two or three and turn the page and like Lisa is naked for like the next five pages. Right. I don't have a problem with nudity. I don't have a problem with seeing her naked, but it does fall into the male gaze trap a bit. Of uh-huh. It's lingering more than it needs to. It's setting up the situation just just so it can linger. Right. And then that's a question also is that whether or not that was something Hutchison put down on paper or is that something Seely did with the art? Right. I know from what I've read of Hack Slash, that's never shied away from nudity too. And again, I don't have a problem, but it's also weird seeing that on the main character, but that's also kind of subversive in a way too. Right. Because you never usually get that from the final girl character. And that was interesting. Mm-hmm. But again, it's also a doomed final girl character. Correct. And I think that might just also kind of further add victimization upon victimization for me. Mm-hmm. I don't have a problem with a lot of the elements so much as how much they compound on top of each other. And again, this was a very harrowing book to read. Like I got to the end of issue three and I'm just like, oh my God, where's it going to go now? And like every Every time I'm turning the page in issue four, I'm like, oh, no. Right. Oh, no. I, like I said, I think if this was something that it was in one or two issues and you just cut down on the number of characters and coincidences and stuff like that and just kind of really pared it down, whichever character you chose to focus on, whether it was Ryan or Lisa or anyone else, you could have told a really good story and I would have been totally fine with it. It's just the fact that it's so relentless right. with its violence and gore and cruelty It's not an easy read. That is where I do struggle with recommending it because it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Right. But anytime you get into extreme horror, that's going to be the case. Correct. Like Hellraiser is certainly not a film I'd recommend to anyone, despite the fact it's one of my favorite films of all time. It's definitely going to be a year mileage may vary. Ultimately, still, though, just the fact that it gave me an emotional experience like that, that I not only rarely get from slasher movies, but from slasher tie-in comic books. Oh, yeah. None. None of the comics we've covered here so far have even come close to giving me the emotional experience this comic did. And I think part of that is just Hutchison, and not to slam all the artists who worked on his independent stuff, but I think having a really good artist like Tim Seeley with him and also having multiple issues to escalate. And I know I'm sounding a little bit hypercritical when I just slammed it. It's a double-edged sword. It's got its good as it Right, exactly. There are good and bad parts to it. But I think the fact that he had four issues to escalate and build up things and also had a really good professional artist with him, I think it helped elevate his game as well. Yeah, I mean, my final thought on this one is I still re- I don't know that it's going to be one that I want to revisit. And again, that kind of brings me actually back to one of my other favorite movies, The Professional. It's an amazing movie, but it's such a harrowing experience that I don't want to subject myself to it maybe more than once half a decade. Right. So I'm not going to be eager to sit down and reread this one for a few years, but it is something I definitely want to pull out and reread. It's definitely something that is on my yes list for the Halloween franchise as a whole. Like if I ever want to go back through the whole Halloween franchise and at least hit the highlights, this would definitely be a highlight for me. Yeah, I think because it's such a dire read at times, (laughs) I think that it's hard for me to recommend it. But I absolutely think it's also a really high quality, not recommend, I guess, is the best way to put it. (laughs) It is something that for me, I think a lot of people will just not be able to get into it just because Mm -hmm. of how unrelenting it is at times. But I do think that what it does is very effective. It, It achieves its goals. 
There's a lot of things that cannot claim that. Right. It's like I said, it's right on that borderline for me. There are parts I really, really enjoy. And I think it got better as it went along. I'm just not quite ready to recommend it yet. But I do right. totally understand why you would enjoy it and why others might want to seek it out. Well, enjoy, in quotes. Yes, certain value. Anything else you want to add before we jump on to the next book? No, let's do the next one. And this one, it's an anthology book, so we'll just kind of take it story by story. Halloween 30 Years of Terror was an anthology one-shot published by Devil's Due in August of 2008. Again, every story in this was written by Stefan Hutchinson. The first story, Trick or Treat, is drawn by the Croatian artist and animator Danijel Zizelj. Those are the consonants and vowels, I think, but I have no idea if you said that even close to right or not. With apologies to Zizelj, I hope I did it okay. If I did not, I so deeply apologize, sir. With colors by Nick Bell. Now, Zizelj got his start as a painter and comic artist in the 90s in Italy with anthology stories first appearing in the U.S. and Ink and Negative Burn. And he actually continues to publish a lot of comics only in Europe that have never really been released in the U.S. For DC, he's done books like Congo Bill, El Diablo, The Sandman Presents the Corinthian, and Superman Metropolis, as well as fill-in issues for Transmetropolitan, Loveless, the DMZ, Hellblazer, Northlander, Scalp, American Vampires, and Desolation Jones. So basically, he's kind of a go-to Vertigo artist. It's a shame that he never got any work. Oh, and I'm not done yet. <laughs> And for Marvel, he's done a number of Captain America titles, The Call of Duty, The Wagon. And at Image, him and Brian Wood did a creator-owned series called Starve. Mm. And recently, he's actually been doing animated shorts for a Croatian animation company called Zagreb, mm. which is at least a word that seems more phonetic. <laughs> Trick or Treat tells the story of the elderly Haddonfield couple Mary and Sam McKenzie. They never had any children of their own and avoid all the hectic shenanigans on Halloween by leaving their door shut for the night. But on one Halloween in 1978, they finally open it for the children, Tommy and Lindsay, who were sent there by their babysitter, Jamie, to report being attacked by the boogeyman. The couple calmly gets what info they can from the children and alert the police, never noticing as Michael passes by their window outside. Years later, the widowed Mary now always opens her door, especially to the children on Halloween, yet things suddenly go wrong. The children start choking on her candy and coughing up blood. Looking in the bowl, she finds all of her candy has little bits of razor sticking out. Turning, she finds Michael sitting in her living room before he again disappears into the night. So, J.D., do you recommend Trick or Treat? Well, yes. <laughs> I like it. It's just there's not a lot of story there, and I think that's going to be no. a continuing theme for some of these shorter anthology stories. The first part of it is just padding. It just shows, oh, hey, the kids came over across the street and we called the police. If you were wondering what happened when Lori Stroud sent Tommy and Lindsay across the street, this is what happens. Nothing interesting, apparently. The last half is kind of good. Those are like really obvious razor blades sticking to that candy. You'd think they cut their fingers just grabbing it. Right. Because those aren't like just lace. Those are literally poking out of every single mm -hmm. piece of candy. But other than that, it's okay. It's a nice little effective story. I don't really think you needed the first half other than just to establish who Miss McKenzie is. It's not something you have to go out of your way to experience as part of the Halloween franchise. It's okay. It's a fun little teaser to the book overall. But it is starting to feel, and we've noticed this in a couple of the tie-ins, of literally just trawling the first Halloween film for anything that's mentioned in it. Any name, anything that's mentioned in it. Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, the kids, go to the McKenzie's. Now here's the story of the McKenzie's. It's kind of like becoming the Jabba's Palace anthology. Yeah. <laughs> Every single character in this entire film has to have a story. I'm going to tell it. Tales from the Cantina and all those things. Yeah, there is a lot of that. Which would be fine if maybe they had time to flesh out the story a little bit right. more. You might have been able to do something where you kind of explored a backstory and they could have played up whether or not they let the kids in a little bit more. And But it's just because you only have so many pages where they have to get to the real meat of the story, which is really the last three pages or so. It just doesn't feel necessary to the plot of what they were really trying to get to, which is just this kind of creepy Michael Myers puts razor blades in candy. Right. And it's, again, one of those things of Michael Myers sees people calling the police. I'm going to come back to them in about 10 years and get revenge on them. It's just kind of another one of those things that Stephen Hutchinson does. Right. And also, it's like, if we're going to do the story about the razor blades and candy, why don't we do the story of the kid from Halloween 2? Right. You know, that kid who went to the hospital on that fateful night with the razor blade in his mouth, and they never really told the story of how he got that razor in his mouth. Yeah, I've always expected that to come back in that movie when I first saw it, and it doesn't. And so I figured right. I, that would be a great opportunity to do that. They never did. Even him and his mom leave the hospital before Michael even starts killing people. 
It's like that was just there just because, oh, Razor Blades and Kennedy is part of the mythos of Halloween. And my other problem with the story is it's just kind of anticlimactic. She's got all these kids bleeding from candy that she gave them, and Michael leaves her, and we never really find out what happens as a result. Like, what are the consequences? Yeah. No, I mean, it's fine. Yeah. But it's just there. It's a fun little nugget. Right. Admittedly, we're dissecting a story that I think is maybe eight pages long, so it's not really intended to be anything more than just what it is, right. more or less, on the page. Wait till we get to a couple more of these. <laughs> yep. So you ready to jump to the next one? Yeah, let's move on. Speaking of yes. ones that are pretty it's much complex, detailed depths that we must explore in this one. I love the nuanced character of Miss Haddonfield. So our next story is POV, which was drawn by Jim Daly with colors by Bob Ruffalo. Back in the 90s, Daly was an inker on Ghost Rider 2099 and Doom 2099. But his only other work as a comic illustrator were this and a story in the anthology Moon Lake, which was also written by Stephen Hutchinson. Hmm. He's done a few covers, but he largely works as a concept artist for the Call of Duty Transformers and Rise of Cthulhu games. A lot of the Rise of Cthulhu cards were drawn by him. You can find him on DeviantArt as JMD3, as opposed to JDDM, my co-host here tonight. (laughs) (laughs) I do not promote decapitating people. POV tells, from her first-person perspective, the story we glimpsed back in Autopsis of the Miss Haddonfield 1991 beauty queen who was beheaded by Michael in front of her dressing room mirror right after winning the crown. So, J.D., tell me about if you recommend or not recommend this complex character study. Well, it's interesting because it's a story that's about truth and beauty and... Peeling back the layers. Yeah, a nuanced look at just (laughs) what it means to be a winner. No, it's horror porn. It is just an extended shot of a woman getting decapitated. And that, no, I can't recommend this. Looking into the eyes of a woman looking into her own eyes as she's being decapitated. Yeah. Which is probably about as deep as, you know, like you said, Hutchison mentioned this in Autopsis and in Sam as well. I just don't understand why he's so obsessed with this one story. We don't even really explore who was Miss Haddonfield of 1991. (laughs) We've had this decapitation image of her now in three stories, and we never know a dang thing about her. Mm -mm. And I think this does also continue to raise some of my concerns with Stephen Hutchinson and lingering on brutal victimization of women, Mm -hmm. which he again does a lot more than he does with the male characters. Again, there's no captions, there's no dialogue, it's just silent images from her point of view as she walks off the stage, goes to her dressing room, and Michael decapitates her over the course of like three pages. It doesn't add anything, considering like he kept coming back to the story. I really figured that there would be like something to come of it, and no, it's just horror porn, and that's yeah. fine if you want to see that, but I don't think even the most diehard gorehound is going to really appreciate this and... It's just splatter. It does kind of vaguely remind me of that one Garth Ennis Punisher issue told entirely from the point of view of a guy's mouth at the dentist office as the Punisher comes in and pays him a visit. (laughs) But it doesn't even have the skill and the humor and wit of that. Right. Or even the artistry, because I think Joe Quesada drew that issue. But yeah, I wonder if one of his future plans for a Halloween story was to finally reveal the saga of Miss Haddonfield 1991. But it's like, we don't even know why Mike. Well, granted, we never know why Michael does what he does, but why this story? Yeah, the fact that he's so obsessed with telling this story over and over again. I think he just thinks the idea of a beauty queen staring at her face while decapitated. I think that's about as deep as it gets, is I think he just thought that would be a really cool image, and he just wants to keep coming back to it because it's something he thinks could be really cool, and it's just, the problem is there's nothing there! Right. It could have been kind of like, remember how in Night Dance you had Lisa always wanting to be a ballerina, and that whole imagery of the ballerina, and her training to become a ballerina, and always dreaming of being a ballerina. Could have had that story here with Miss Haddonfield, the beauty queen, always wanted to be a beauty queen from childhood on, dreamed the dream of being a beauty queen. And the moment she achieved it, that's the last thing she got to do in this life. Right. Could have had something interesting there, but let's just do a gore gimmick. So, final thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I think we've said all we can on that one. Yeah. yeah. And even the art is, it's fine. It's just showing really ugly stuff that we didn't really need. Mm-hmm. Agreed. So, yeah, let's move on to Visiting Hours. Visiting Hours is illustrated by Brett Weldell. Waddell has been doing miniseries and graphic novels for years, including Wanderlust, Couscous Express, Shot Collars, B-Sides, Julius, Silent Ghost, The Straw Man, The Light, Spontaneous, Pariah, one that I'm deeply familiar with, the infamous Southland Tales prequel trilogy. 
Oh, you lucky person. And another book I own, Surrogates, which was adapted into the film starring Bruce Willis. I own four separate books by this guy. I have no familiarity with him. (laughs) I mean, I've heard of the Southlands comic. I think during that one weekend, you maybe flipped through one of them briefly and then just kind of set it aside. Yeah, quite possibly. (laughs) Visiting Hours is a dreamlike tale flashing on various points in Laurie Strode's life, walking past the Myers home on that day in 1975 looking over her young son, John, in the 80s, looking over students as a teacher in the 90s, and standing at the window in her last days in the asylum as she thinks back on how the memories from Halloween 2 emerged of the first time she was taken to visit her brother Michael as a child and how she's still haunted by images of her slain friend Annie. So do you recommend visiting hours? No, it's way better than the last one. It's better than POV, but I think the art is not good. It's not terrible, but it's not good. I had to read through this like three times before I realized what was going on, that this was her like imagining in the asylum. I honestly thought these were just regular flashbacks. and They're kind of flashbacks with fantasy added. And to be honest, the art at the end, I thought that was another character. It didn't look enough like Laurie. I guess the doll should have been obvious, but yeah, I didn't care for it that much. I liked it better than you did. I actually think it's a really nice chapter for Laurie Strode because just narratively wise, it's a nice bridge between all the films and where she ends up in Resurrection. Personally, my choice would have been to not even have Resurrection be in continuity. Yeah. But I don't know if that was part of the licensing that they had to because I know the Akkads were very much involved with the production of these comics. But if you're going to have to, this is not a bad way as a nice lead in. Like, this is a nice thing that I could see as like a nice little prequel before you sit down and watch the opening of Resurrection. Yeah, and I think it kind of works in that way. I just have a lot of bad feelings towards Resurrection in general. So like trying to bridge H2O and Resurrection is like trying to bridge the land of chocolate to shit town. So it's not something I need or want in my life. Well, but we all have that bridge. It's call our colon. Oh, Thanks, Noel. Now I'll picture that when I think of this comic, my colon. Yeah, as I said, I've experienced this guy's art in the past. I kind of liked his art in Surrogates, though it wasn't great, especially because you couldn't really tell all the characters apart, but it kind of fit the universe that they were building. And the prequels to Southland Tales were a whole thing. (laughs) Probably the worst thing about the prequels to Southland Tales is it was all black and white. Mm. Here, I actually do kind of like the color that he's adding, mostly because I've seen his work in black and white makes it even more indistinct i will say like the splashes of red on annie it is quite striking i actually do kind of like some of those panels right and i like annie i've always liked the character of annie especially always like the actress nancy loomis so it's kind of nice to have a little reminder of her even though i didn't realize that was her in the 80s where both her and laurie have perms (laughs) that was funny yeah but i don't know the thing about the art is i don't love it but i don't dislike it i see what you mean by laurie doesn't always look like the same person I kind of get that because of the stylization, but my main thing with Weldell is his art is kind of like a watered-down Ben Templesmith. Yeah, I can see that. He's not as exaggerated. He's not even as sketchy as Ben Templesmith, but there's a lot of similarities to their style, especially in the way they use color. His art is very simple. His art almost feels like layouts. It almost feels like these are the rough sketches that you'll then draw a page from. Yeah. And as layouts, they're fine layouts, especially when he's working with the way that Stefan Hutchinson breaks down stories. And I really like the way Hutchinson breaks down the story, but it does feel unfinished. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a stylistic choice, but sometimes I like that stylistic choice. Sometimes I don't. I don't know. Here, it's kind of a mixed bag because it fits the kind of sketchy dreamlike blend of drifting memories and fantasies that are forcing their way in. I don't know. I like it. If it had a different artist, I think I would probably appreciate it a lot more. Overall, I don't think the art really worked for me. But it's fine. I liked it way better than POV because there is an actual story here. And it's a story that actually does tie into the kind of broader world in a nice way. Yeah. Anyways, are you ready for our next essential one? Yes. Tommy and the Boogeyman was drawn by Jeffrey Zornow and Lee Ferguson with colors by Zornow and Rob Ruffalo. Zornow has done issues of 68 for Image and Godzilla for IDW, the one-shot Day of the Dead, the Rising of Bub, and stories for the horror anthologies Gene Simmons' House of Horrors, Agnes Quill, Grimm's Fairy Tales, Moonlight, and Street Fables, and he also does custom t-shirts and poster art for underground bands. And Lee Ferguson has done issues of Chamber, Psyblade, Detective Comics, Forgotten Realms, Snake Eyes, Kato, Flash Gordon, Sheena, Supergirl, Turok, and Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons, 
as well as the U.S. comic adaptation of All You Need Is Kill, the novel that Edge of Tomorrow was based on. In Tommy and the Boogeyman, we catch up with Tommy Doyle in 2005, where he's living in Utah with his wife and their son Jamie. She berates him about leaving a trashy comic sitting out where their kid can see it, and Tommy flips through the vintage collectible of Tarantula Man, which tells of an over-the-top horror figure who does really nasty things to a pair of teenage girls and their panty drawer. Tommy puts the book away and returns to the comic he himself is drawing, which appears to relate the stories of Halloween's 4 through 6. So, JD, thoughts? <laughs> it's interesting. I actually kind of like this one. Definitely has some issues with the sexualization. It, like, really, really, really... He's literally sniffing her panties. her panties. Yeah. Not only that, I'm pretty sure these are supposed to be teenage, like, high school age girls. Yes. I mean, admittedly, we don't see any of the naughty bits, but we do see a naked girl. Like, less than 18-year-old girl. That's not good. But I will say, other than that, I kind of like the bizarreness of having this weird horror story that really doesn't tie into Halloween at all in this Halloween comic. I don't know why. It just makes me laugh a little bit. And also, I do like the art. I think it's like a really nice throwback to some of those Tales from the Crypt type horror comics that you would see back in those days. Admittedly, I just wish it didn't have the perverse elements in there. I also kind of like the idea, if you're going to write out Halloween's 4 through 6, making it a comic that Tommy wrote and drew is kind of clever, especially when you get to part 6 where he's a self-insert hero. So I kind of like this story. How dare you say <laughs> See, I like this one, and the other one that you love, no, I don't recommend. No, no, you're free to feel that way. I feel about this the way you do Halloween Resurrection. <laughs> I've always been kind of interested by the character Tommy Doyle. The movies did their thing with Tommy Doyle. We had the Chaos Comics version of Tommy Doyle. I find that after we get those two versions, it's kind of a letdown that, oh yeah, Tommy Doyle is just living a quiet life as a comic book artist in Utah. Does he look like Joe Quesada to you? Well, he certainly doesn't look like Paul Rudd. <laughs> that, yes. I'm wondering if I might be one of the artists themselves just doing a little self-portrait. Yeah, possibly. We got two main things to talk about. We have the Tommy Doyle aspect, and then we'll get to the main comic inside. I also just really don't like, let's just piss off four, five, and six. Those do have their fans and their followers, and I just think this is a really cheap way of just kind of writing them out. I don't think they're writing it out. I think it's a way to acknowledge it because Hutchison has chosen that he's using the H2O continuity. And so at least it's a way of acknowledging those films in their own way. I don't think he's trying to say like, oh, this is just a dumb comic book that Tommy invented. Well, I just, I've never been the biggest fan. Like, remember that whole story arc in the comics where it was revealed that Captain America actually was a comic book artist so we can show some of the old Joe Simon comics? Mm. It's just never a gimmick that I find that interesting. Something about it just really wrote me around. And then, yeah, then the Tarantula Man comic. What's weird is that because of the sexualization it does, it doesn't even feel like an old EC comic. No, not really. Which it's kind of referencing. Because those you wouldn't have a naked teenage girl where you have a shot of the webbing draped between her legs and then focus as a tarantula is born up through her throat. Yeah. And then the whole following her panties up to the guy sniffing them. This is, again, falling into some concerns I have about Stefan Hutchinson's taste when it comes to how he portrays women in his comics. Mm -hmm. This feels like something you would get at a Xenoscope comic. Right. The Grimm's Fairy Tales people. Which I think this artist has done some of Grimm's stuff. Yeah. So quite possibly. But I really like the art style. No, it's a fun throwback to the old horror comics. It's just that it's this really uncomfortable, non-adult teenager. It's just really trashy and gross. <laughs> yeah, it's an uncomfortable material. I really can't recommend it, but I do kind of get some enjoyment out of the story. The art style itself is really fun. It is a nice throwback to like the 70s horror comics, like, you know, the House of Secrets and House of Mystery type stuff. Right. You could see this being a story that's introduced by Cain and Abel. Right. When I don't know who did what the art style in the framing story is not the same art style in the comic so i don't know if one person did one in the other or if there's a collaboration on some of it and it could have just been like hutchison saying what type of story do you want to tell and i'll kind of let you go nuts and i'll just script it anyways not a lot to say about it other than that it's kind of just there right i kind of got a giggle out of it but it's definitely like a guilty thing and, it's, and like i said 
The parts that I don't like, I really don't like. I really think you could have avoided the sexualization and the panty sniffing. I can definitely see why it's a comic a mom would be pissed off that her kid is reading. No, oh, yes. <laughs> I would be a comic. I'd be like questioning why you have that in your house at all. Especially if it's a vintage copy. Why would you just leave it like <laughs> Yeah. That would be bagged and boarded, sir. <sighs> Tommy, you're just a fake geek boy. He's a fake geek self-insert. <laughs> yep. Let's get to our final story, Repetition Compulsion, which again brings back Tim Seeley on the art with colors again by Elizabeth John. Repetition Compulsion picks up with Loomis in 1989 when he is already, I can't tell if he's living with Marion at this point or if they're still just hanging out together. I'm not sure. I'm thinking he's living, but I remember him moving in with Marion was part of the story of the three we covered in the last episode, but I can't remember when that happened in the chronology. Mm -hmm. But anyways, it's Loomis and Marion. On Halloween of that year, he discovers things have been moved around in his office, pointing a Michael Myers mask at a map of Haddonfield with the drawing of a dog pinned at the elementary school. Loomis and Marion race off to the school where they find a slashed and dying dog on the playground with a drawing of Sam stapled to it. It's not until the next day that Sam learns Michael was killing one of the teachers in a classroom while they spied on Loomis through a window, and her students find her body the next morning hanging from the swing set with barbed wire stretching out a smile on her face. So, J.D., do you recommend this one? I do. I still love Tim Seeley's artwork, and I love the idea of Michael just fucking with Loomis. Just like, oh, you're going to kill a dog? Oh, you crazy guy. And then he completely misses the actual victim. So, yeah, I liked it. On top of that, I also kind of like the study of, of this one teacher who's always trying to reassure her students where no matter how scary Halloween gets, always smile and have fun. And so Michael kills her in a way where she has a permanent smile on her face and is displayed to all of the children in her classroom. Yeah. That in itself feels like an easy comic. Again, it's lingering on violence committed to women. Mm -hmm. But it's a fun little nugget chapter again. It fits within the universe that he's doing. It has right. just a nice little side chapter between all the Loomis stories that we covered in the last episode. I mean, the Tim Seeley art's great again. Right. Seeing Seeley do Loomis, I don't know. I just think he really nails the characterization mm -hmm. at times. Like, the way he's holding the gun, and I think there's, like, one scene where he snaps, and he just looks so much less like Donald Pleasance without it being mm -hmm. too photo referency or anything like that. The art is fantastic, and the story is not Hutchison's best, but it's enjoyable. It fits the mold that he's done before. Right. I do think we're starting to see way too much of a pattern with this victimization of women. Yeah. Why couldn't this teacher be a dude? Why is it a hot, arched-backed woman? Right. It's something that should be pointed out. It's one of those things where it's not so much that it's wrong as it's something that if you just keep doing it, it compounds on itself. Right. If you just take this story on its own... It's a nice little horror story. Yeah, it's just a nice little horror story. If you start looking at the patterns when you're analyzing all these stories like we have been, you just start seeing patterns that just feel slightly uncomfortable. Or in the case of the last story, really uncomfortable. And you can argue that staying true to the formula of slasher stories, the formula of Halloween, <laughs> but you're also not really doing anything to subvert or comment that. You're not doing anything to stand apart from that formula. Which is interesting because there's a lot of stylistic things he's doing that really stands apart from the formula. Right. And even then, I don't think Halloween has ever... I mean, there's obviously been a lot of victimization of women, but I don't think it's... It's never been as bad as Friday the 13th. Right. And I don't think it's ever been as gratuitous as some of the stuff that we see here. Halloween, if you think about it, has even had very few actual, like, boob shots. Right. Most of the kills are not overly gory. And even in the ones where they are, a lot of the people being killed are men, too. Right. And again, there's not usually a sexualization, and there's not usually a lingering on the actual mm. kills. Which admittedly, that's part of the nature of comics. You're looking yeah. at a moment frozen. But he's not letting that one moment be the only moment. He's having like two, sometimes three pages of that moment. Right. Like the last page with her strung up with this barbed smile. Mm -hmm. That's two thirds of the page with a smaller panel that's just kind of looking at the face more up close. It right. is a conscious choice to display it that way. And that's not necessarily a bad choice. No, I'm not actively saying that Stephen Hutchins is doing anything wrong. I'm just saying that it's kind of becoming so constant that I would want to just point it out to him as to maybe maybe try something different. Right. No, exactly. <laughs> At least nothing I've seen makes me think that he's doing anything with malice or anything like that. I just right. don't know if he's just aware of the recurring themes that keep happening in these comics, especially in this one. I mean, my main problems with Alan Moore haven't always been the things that Alan Moore does so much as he keeps doing them again and again and again. Right. And they just start compounding. 
You know, and I think that's the issue that people have with a lot of tropes in general is it's not so much that the tropes are wrong as it's just they keep seeing them again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you really need to start breaking down the discussion of is this something that's genuinely a problem or is it just something you're just getting tired of? Right. You know, and there does have to be a difference between the two and both of them can be addressed in separate ways. Again, I don't want to sound like I'm just purely saying, how dare you, Stefan Hutchinson, you misogynist. When again, you know, this is such few stuff he's done in his career. This is still so early in his comic writing career, and he hasn't done much before and not much since. Right. Where would he be if he was given an ongoing now? Would he still be doing that? I'd be curious. No, and that's the thing I got to say about Stefan Hutchinson is, and kind of jump into some final thoughts overall early, just on this one point is, everything I've read by Stefan Hutchinson makes me want to read more Stefan Hutchinson. Even some of the issues I have with it doesn't change the fact I want to read more of this guy's work. I agree completely. Out of the entire long box carpentry, I think he's one of the best writers we've gotten. He seems to understand the material without just mimicking it. And again, mixing him with Tim Seeley, right. who's a powerful artist, that's just like a winning combination. Exactly. God, I'd love to see their Thing comic. <laughs> no, seriously, imagine him actually know, getting I, I, into I, the head of a Thing. Oh, yeah. And having Tim Seeley's art, mm -hmm. he'd probably be able to do some really cool stuff with that. Mm-hmm. Dark Horse, I hope you're listening. <laughs> I hope you still have it. You never know after Northman's Nightmare, you might have to beg him again. <laughs> so anyways, Halloween, 30 Years of Terror, overall, the whole anthology comic. Do you recommend it as something that people should check out? I'd say yeah. If you're a Halloween fan, it's probably rare enough now because Devil's Due no longer has the license and so mm -hmm. they can't reprint this. If you find this and it's not too expensive, I'd say absolutely just check it out. There's enough good stuff here. You might have to sift through some shit, but even like the worst parts like POV or the Traditional Man comic, they're not terrible. It just increases the count on your mileage, may vary. Right, right. <laughs> but the good parts are really good. And I think that especially the Tim Seeley story at the end is just worth it for the art alone. I don't recommend it as something that people should go out of the way to see, even if you're a Halloween fan. I think there's other places that would be better to start first. But if you dig into the Stefan Hutchinson stuff elsewhere and you enjoy it, then yeah, go here because there are still some nice little nuggets of extra bonuses if that's the stuff you like. Yeah, exactly. And then we move on to our final story, Halloween, The First Death of Laurie Strode, which was published by Devil's Due from September and October of 2008. It was meant to be a three-issue miniseries, but something happened at Devil's Due, and all of their Halloween comics came to an end before the final issue could be released, and despite the fact that there are solicits for it and cover images out there, issue three was never released. And it's again written by Hutchinson with art by Jeff Zoranow, who was the guy who did the Tommy and the Boogeyman story we mentioned earlier with colors by Nick Filardi. I kind of ran out of time to write a synopsis on this one. Suffice it to say, the story starts right immediately after Halloween 2. I think it's set in November of that year where everyone's just recovering. They have the funeral for Annie. Lori is still recovering from the psychological and physical trauma. She's still recovering from having learned from her parents that she's adopted, which she never knew. And her parents keep trying to placate her by buying her things and she's rejecting them. She makes friends with another high school girl named Sally, who the only reason she wasn't hanging out with Lori, Annie, and Linda in the first movie is because she was sick that day. And so she kind of has a bit of the survivor's guilt. Lori definitely has survivor's guilt. They start experimenting with drugs and alcohol, which Lori starts falling deep, deep into. We catch up with Jimmy, the nurse from the second movie, who's suffering lingering brain damage from the head wound he received. Lori goes to her graduation. Loomis is still clashing with Sheriff Brack, who blames him for Michael having gotten loose in the first place. And Lori, even though everyone believes Michael is dead and that he burned to death, we find out one of the firemen mysteriously had his neck snapped on the location and nobody could find the body of Michael Myers. So, of course, <laughs> Lori starts seeing Michael everywhere. He even attacks her at a Halloween party wearing an adult version of the clown suit from the first movie. Then there's a whole trap where he ends up killing Jimmy. And then that's the cliffhanger. The death of Jimmy is where we end, and we never got issue three. There's not even a synopsis of issue three anywhere. So that's kind of all we have. And so it's hard to ask if you recommend it or not, but are you kind of yay or nay on the first death of Laurie Strode, at least what we've read of it? 
Of what we got, I do recommend it. At least, let me put it this way. I wish we had gotten issue three. Yeah. It's not something where I was going, oh, thank God, this never got completed. No, it, it makes me wish that we got a conclusion to the story. I enjoy it. I like the exploration of Lori and just seems to me like a realistic take of what somebody who has survived such an ordeal would, you know, the survivor's guilt is, I think, handled well and believably. And it's like not only surviving, but finding out you're related to that guy and your parents yeah. are not your parents. So, yeah, I liked it. When I said I liked another artist almost as much as Tim Seeley, as far as Zernow, his start was fine in the last story with the Tarantula Man comic. But this, I think, actually works really well. So I think it's probably my second favorite as far as art, especially with the Halloween stuff and probably just the entire long box carpentry stuff we've done so far. It's really solid. It's expressive. And yeah, I, I just enjoy this comic. And it's just a shame that we may never get that third issue. I agree. I think it's even interesting and worth looking at if you really like the first two movies to just instantly pick up what happened immediately after. Picking up the pieces of where everyone was left, Loomis recovered from his burns rather quickly. I was going to say his face should be at least bandaged. It should be pretty raw by this point. Yeah. He shouldn't already look like he looks in like Halloween 6. Right. <laughs> I still think it has some interesting stuff. I actually really like that twist of Jimmy because there was that click between him and Lori. You'd think, oh, yeah, maybe they would actually be happy. But no, he has brain injuries. She's in the middle of her issues or she is rejecting him a lot. His parents blame her for a lot. Yeah. Jimmy was the character I really didn't care about, but I actually kind of liked him in this story. Dude, that was Lance Guest, man. Lance freaking Guest, the last Starfighter. How could you not care? <laughs> Because he wasn't <laughs> given anything interesting to do in the movie. But be Lance Guest. What more do you need? But, well, okay, fair enough. One <laughs> aspect I really do enjoy in this comic is I kind of like the fact that it's Laurie exploring her familial connection to Michael, which yeah. is something that they never did in the movies. Like it was one of those things that was included in the second film as a what a twist type moment. But it doesn't, she's not really given any moment to really like dwell on that in the movie. And the only time it, she does is H2O, where she's had 20 years to process it. Mm -hmm. So, like, actually having her go through her older sister do this diary, and we already discussed the idea that Michael was always kind of a little messed up. Right. And just her dawning realization of how messed up Michael is and that she's connected to him. It's a nice little touch that I think probably would have paid off in the third issue a little bit more, mm -hmm. but I liked where it was going. My only issue is that it's through the diary of Judith. Where did that come from? <laughs> right. And the fact that nobody ever found that. All he had to do was Loomis just gives her the diary because it's part of the files that he has on Michael. That's all he had right. to do for that. They didn't have to be that it was some mysterious diary that no one found. But I like a lot of that backstory. I like that Lori is struggling deeply because, again, we touched in our H2O episode just how much it deals with her alcoholism and mm -hmm. her own self-destructive behavior. It's great seeing the deep, deep crash of her first experiencing that and like seeing the hallucinations of her adoptive parents mangled as the real parents were in the car crash. I even love that Ben Tramer, who was just a kind of throwaway joke in the first two movies, the guy that she has the hot is the guy who dies wearing a Michael Myers mask, this really explores how fucked up that was and how much that would mess up Laurie to learn. Right. No, I like that. And I like the little touch of like the costume shop guy seeing all the Michael Myers masks on the shelf and just throwing them out and then hearing somebody in the trash and then, and then just finding them gone. Like, oh, that explains where he gets all those masks from. Yeah. He just saved them all those years and, you know, yeah. make sure to oil the latex so it doesn't crack. Yeah, he's read up on his mass care. <laughs> There's a lot of nice little touches here. And I honestly thought, presumably, what's going to happen is just going to set up how Lori fakes her death and changes her name in H2O. Right. Unfortunately, we just don't quite get there. But it's still interesting stuff leading up to him. Right. I thought that was going to be like a pointless story is like, oh, well, something happened where she encountered Michael and she realized like she can't just presume he's dead and so has to hide. Right. Except because it's not really about that. It's more about exploring the aftermath of going through such a harrowing experience. If you cut Michael out of this, you have a fascinating character study of what it's like to be the survivor of a slasher movie mm -hmm. who goes through all the twists of a slasher movie and then just has to live with that. But then by putting Michael in, you start to sow the seeds of why she'd be willing to go to the extreme she does to just escape entirely. Yeah. In that she now knows he's still alive and no one else believes he's alive. 
That's great. And then you also instantly set up Marion's there to set up why she knows the secret and why she's targeted at the beginning of H2O. I mean, hell, they even set up the doll she has in Halloween Resurrection in terms of how she knows how to hide pills in it. And there's just so many little details, like she's in a wheelchair during the funeral for uh, the family. Because she broke her ankle, yeah. Yeah, which makes sense. It's like so much thought has obviously gone into this. And obviously Stephen Hutchins is a super fan, and that's to be expected. But a lot of times, even super fans, they just focus about what happens on the screen. They don't focus on what's the likely aftermath of that. And to see right. that is really well done. Right. And it's not falling into the traps that we sometimes see, like we saw with the McKenzie story, where it's like, let's just trawl for a name and build the story around it. Or even like Halloween 6, where it's like, let's try to tie everything together. It's actually, let's take everything that was there in that first movie and then be like, okay, what happens the next day? Because mm -hmm. that was one of the things I loved about Halloween 2 was while Halloween 2 is kind of a mess of a movie, it's one of the few to explore of, okay, what happens the next day? Or even what happens the next minute? And what happens right. literally picking up the pieces from the first movie? And I kind of like that this does that in a more long form of, okay, Halloween and Halloween 2 have happened. Now, where do we go from there? Immediately picking up the pieces. Yeah, it's just the more we go through it, and I, I liked it from the very beginning, but the more we go through it, the more I just appreciate like all this detail and thought put into it, and the more I'm frustrated that it just never concluded, right. at least not in any way that we can have access to. Stephen Hutchison, if you have access to the file, <laughs> feel free to send it our way. Like We will gladly finish off whatever you have, even if it's just the script. We'll just talk about it, yeah. <laughs> But no, it, while I've had my concerns about Stefan Hutchinson and some of my criticisms about the levels of certain things he does, it's never changed the fact that I've been fascinated to see what he's done with this franchise right. and where he's gone with it and how he's explored it, how he's given it a level of depth and complexity that he's made it into character studies. Other than H2O, Halloween has never been about character studies, ever. It's never had that depth. Right. Him, it's like every story, every person has a story. And he's really fascinated about digging into the details of it. And oftentimes, he tells some really interesting ones. Exactly. And I, oh, I just, there's just so much here. And not only that, the two people who die in this story is the old creepy pervert right? and Jimmy. He kills the last starfighter, which is a shame, but... Now who is going to defend them from the Kodan Armada? Well, that's why they have those arcades out, so they'll find some more. But I like the fact that they, like, I don't know if that was intentional on his part, like maybe somebody pointed it out to him, or if that just fits the story he was trying to tell. But right. it seems like this story managed to avoid the victimization. Admittedly, I kind of expect Sally to die in the third issue. The only kind of odd moment was that bit where Sally is just laying on the bed at the party and guys just start having sex on her. Yeah. What I appreciated about that moment is, again, it didn't really feel like it was overly lingering. No. You have the one shot where you see her and then it's more just exploring just how far down the hole both her and Lori have fallen in their addictions. Right. Because part of the big backstory with H2O is that John's father is still a meth head. Mm -hmm. So we know that John is the product of her depths into substance abuse. I don't even know if one of the people that we've met at the party is supposed to be John's father, if this is starting to lead her in the direction of where she would meet John's father. Possibly. I like that they're picking up that thread and that it's not a hopeful story for Lori. It's very much a story of just about her falling into substance abuse and becoming a complete wreck. And I like the fact that all the three guys at the party, they're all dressed up as vampires. They're all parasites, basically. Mm. I imagine that has to be intentional because they all have the pop collar cape thing going on. Yep. So I have a feeling that that has to be a subtle, like these are people who are taking advantage of these two girls who are suffering from this terribly traumatic thing and they're taking advantage of them. Right. It's a fascinating story. And part of the thing about Stephen Hutchinson's way of writing, and we kind of got into this in Night Dance too, is he'll set up a lot of elements and then it's seeing how that puzzle puts itself together as the story goes along. Mm -hmm. That kind of makes it even more painful that we don't get that final chapter to see how everything is going to finally come together. Right. Man, I would love to read that issue three. I know. Stephen Hutchinson, seek us out. We will be fair. We will honor the story. We will get it out there to the masses. Yes, we may say some things about how you treat women, but that's deserved. Right. Be fair. And to be fair, <laughs> we, we've never said anything bad about you as a person. We're just... I get a hint that your feet might be smelly, but we'll be fair about it. We'll recommend some good powders, and then we'll focus on your writing. Yes, because we are on pins and needles, so we need to know what happens next. Yeah. Should we go ahead and just mention Mark of the Thorn here? Yeah, let's do that. 
they already had solicits out for issue three and he was already doing interviews and they released some early cover art for then the next miniseries after this was supposed to be Halloween Mark of the Thorn, where he was going to do his own version of bringing the cult of the thorn into his continuity in his universe. I remember him saying that he was also going to bring in maybe some of the other characters from Halloween's four through six, since those are outside his continuity, finding a way to work them into his continuity by reintroducing them and reestablishing them. I would have been curious to see where he would have gone with that. Yeah. I mean, I know you weren't a super fan of it being part of Tommy's comic, and I imagine that's where it would tie into. Oh, God, no. I don't want that to be with the folks in the series. Yeah, I have a feeling that's what he was trying to build up to. Is like He was going to say, like, this is all part of Tommy's thing, but whether or not no, he— No, I don't have hope at all. Well, it depends on how he did it, and I kind of get the impression it was basically his way of doing a story set in that middle trilogy. Well, no, but I know he specifically said that he was going to work them into the continuity of his new series. So I don't think right. it was going to be like a comic set within the comic. That technically would be working it within the continuity. You're not telling me what I want to hear, JD. I know, I know. I personally would still like to read it. I have a feeling it's probably sitting on a file on somebody's computer somewhere. So again, Stephen Hutchison, call us, tweet, email, whatever you got. Just let us take a look at it. <laughs> we just want to know what was going to happen next. Yes. Because we like enough of your stuff. We want to know. Yeah. No, I want to track down more stuff. Like I know he did a Day of the Dead comic tying into that movie. I believe I remember seeing an interview where he was doing like a part three of there were these horror movies in the 80s, Demons and Demons 2, and he did his own version of Demons 3. I'd love to read that. I want to read more stuff. Even reading Sam, the short story, Stefan, write a novel. I'd buy it. Yeah. I'd promote it. I want to read it. I want more Stefan Hutchinson written things in the world. Yeah. There's a lot of bad schlocky horror out there, and there are definitely stories that he's done that are like that. But he's also got just enough mastery of character. Even the bad, schlocky ones tend to have an element of that for the most part. I mean, except for maybe POV and the Tarantula Man thing. <laughs> the characters are fleshed out. They don't feel like a stereotype, you know, this is mm -hmm. the slutty girl, this is the smart girl, or anything like that. They're all characters. They're all people. I want the world to have more things created by this guy in it. I want him to be more prolific than he has been, I should say. I hope we get a time where it's like Stephen Hutchinson just starts, maybe not quite to the degree of Steve Niles, but starts churning stuff out. Right. I want more stuff. I want more Stephen Hutchinson as well. Yeah. So overall, do you recommend that people, especially if they're fans of Halloween, explore the Stephen Hutchinson universe of titles? I do. It's a little hard to recommend The Death of Lloyd Strode without a finale, but I still think, like, the oeuvre, it's worth exploring. Some of it is better than others, and there's definitely, like we've said throughout this episode, that there are definitely themes that are a little uncomfortable, especially when it comes to women. But there's just enough there. There's far more than most horror sequels ever give beyond just a body count. I absolutely recommend, you know, if you're a hardcore Halloween fan, just try it out. Some of it's available for free on the website, isn't it? I think a couple of those earlier short ones were. Yeah. Track those down and see what you think. And if you like it, then maybe try to hunt down the rest. My recommend is start with Night Dance. Because Night Dance, I think, is the most complete story. It's mm -hmm. the story that kind of most stands on its own. And it's kind of the most expansive of all the stories. So, I mean, if you're looking for, like, let's just sit down and get, like, a complete story that is very representative of the broader Stephen Hutchinverse style, plus the Tim Seeley art. I think Night Dance is just a really great Halloween entry. It's a hard book. Yeah. Don't expect it to be a fun slasher story. It's a pretty grueling one, but it's the pinnacle of what you can achieve in a tie-in comic, especially for a slasher movie. It's so hard to do horror comics these days, and this one does it so well while also being a really good Michael Myers story. And then once you got that as like the basic framework, then you get all these little stories that fill in around it. I think, yeah, absolutely check out Night Dance. And if you enjoy that, then you've got all these other little treats to dig up and enjoy. I would love to see it all come back in print someday. Yeah. I don't know how the rights are spread out. I don't know if there's somebody who has license and if they, right. if they do, if they have the rights to publish old stuff or not. I know a lot of it is owned by the film rights owners. Hopefully it might eventually come out. I saw a post from Stephen Hutchinson on a Halloween message board from a few years back where I think Devil's Due still had the license at the time. They just had not published the last issue of The Death mm. of Laurie Strode. And he was convinced that it will eventually come out, but he said it probably will be a long while. We're coming up on a decade. <laughs> and now that digital comics are so much more right. common... 
I think that there's a strong possibility that if somebody had the rights to publish them, they probably would. You could just put them up on Comixology. It would cost probably almost nothing to do that. Well, and I know part of the complication, especially with the first death of Laurie Strode, is that whenever the license goes to another company, usually the rights to publish any pre-existing tie-ins can move to that company. Like we've seen like Transformers, you know, IDW can reprint all the Marvel stuff. Star Wars. Marvel can now reprint all the Dark Horse stuff and previously Dark Horse was printing all the Marvel stuff. Mm -hmm. I know that can happen, but one of the problems that they came up with in Transformers was when IDW got the rights to reprint all of, I think it was the Dreamwave publications, they were not allowed to reprint the unpublished art of the mm. final issues that hadn't been printed. Even though there were several issues that had been fully completed, because they had not been previously printed, those rights did not transfer over. It makes a certain amount of sense. And that would probably mean that they would have to redo it all from scratch. Unless everyone agrees. Right. Unless everybody agrees, and which I imagine devils do. Would, if they got some small cut, would probably be appreciate just getting some money, because apparently they had problems paying their creators. Who knows? Unfortunately, that's all behind-the-scenes stuff that we'll probably never be privy to, but it is a shame. Yeah, and I would have loved to have just even just heard what he was actually going to do for Mark of the Thorn. Because most of the interviews I find were leading up to the release of Mark of the Thorn, so he was more teasing it. I haven't mm -hmm. really found any interviews where he like flat out says, this is what I was going to do for that story. Right. Alas, we're just left on a cliffhanger. Yeah. It's kind of, unfortunately, the end of, well, not the end of Longbox Carpentry, but it is the end of the Halloween. It is, JD. I'm replacing you. Oh. Well, I hope you get somebody good. No, I'm never replacing you. Ah, <laughs> uh, thank you. I'll only replace you in jest. Or, I mean, if you get Stephen Hutchinson, like, I will work with you, Noel, but not with that JD guy. Get Stephen Hutchinson, because I imagine his insight will be a lot more nuanced than mine. I'd rather he tell the stories than tell me about them. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. If he wants to take over writing John Carpenter's Asylum comics, we'll feature it gladly. <laughs> <laughs> This has been a wonderful journey through these because this was honestly of the thing, the Snake Pliskins and the Halloweens. The Halloweens are the ones I had the lowest expectations for. Oh, same here. Because Slasher works so horribly in comics often. Yeah, it's like that POV was kind of the embodiment of mm -hmm. the problems with that. But the fact is, POV seemed to be the outlier in these type of stories. Even though the like the Chaos comics... They were actually kind of fun, though. Yeah, they were not nearly as good as The Devil's Do and Stephen Hutchinson independent stuff. But yeah, they had some entertainment value to them. And that's a lot more than some of those thing comics that I didn't care for at all. I was all set to argue that Snake Plissken Chronicles was still the best one we had come to so far, which I know you don't agree with. Right. But it was something that I really enjoyed. Man, did Stephen Hutchinson blow that out of the water. Especially with Night Dance, which I said is maybe not my favorite personally. I think Death of Laura Strode could have topped it possibly as far as what I was looking to get out of it. It just shows like he was growing as a writer because I like the independent stuff okay. Part of it was he just didn't have good artists on those. Yeah, he probably didn't have the budget to pay a professional level artist and having a big company to be able to afford somebody like Tim Seeley, it helps a lot. Even then, I think his writing has grown more solid. Like I said, just all the detail in The Death of Laurie Strode, the two issues that we got, is just fascinating. And so it's a damn shame that this is how it ends, unfortunately. But I would love if, like I said, if you're out there, give us a call, mm -hmm. tweet us, whatever. This ends this era of coverage for long box carpentry. And this is where we're now going to be getting into the actual official John Carpenter era of the comics, where we have the big trouble in Little China and Escape from New York and Asylum and those Halloween specials he's been doing. We're going to be taking a few months away from Longbox, and we haven't figured out how you and I are going to break down those new ones, but we're going to cover them. Yeah. To be honest, I was a little reluctant going on. I think I said early on, like, I don't really I have like a lot of on people. I, well, no, I, I don't like a lot of licensed comics because right, a lot right. of time they're either just repeating the same things that we've seen before or they're just crap. They go so wildly off. Yeah, yeah they're, they're just terrible. And because you're such a fan of licensed tie-in comics, that's why we're also going to be starting a podcast going through all of the Predator and Alien comics, as well as all 22 issues of Fright Night. Kill me now. <laughs> For you, Noel, I would do that. But let's not. No. Anyways, JD, thank you for joining me again. Well, thank you for having me, Noel. And this is where we shut and file away another long box carpentry. Didn't quite work as well as it did in my head there, but... <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night.
Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Typing with my right hand and I'm left-handed because I have a large pillow in front of my microphone to keep the fans from my computer <laughs> muffled. Because I've had to over-filter so many podcasts because that fan, I just decided to stick a pillow on my desk. Mm. Okay. Right. Most of the gores are not overly killy, or, or sorry, most of the gores are not overly killy. Most of the kills are not overly gory. <laughs>